Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I am Steve Adubato. That is the lovely and talented, what is she, Vanna White? She's Mary Gamble. I just aged myself. I don't even know if she's uh, still well, on the air you, anymore. You may, be, you may be aging, Steve, but you look incredible. You look incredible. Uh, Mary, you already got the bonus that you asked for. You don't need to, you know. Uh, hey, listen, speaking about bonuses, we got a bonus with great, we have Roger DeRose coming up in just a minute. But before we get to Roger, let's tell folks the terrific sponsors of Lessons in Leadership who understand the importance of leadership and helping the audience we serve. Go ahead, Mary. They sure do. Well, so I'm laying it on thick today. I got to stop. I know, I know. It must be that tie. I said, I think that's a big debut for Lessons in Leadership. I don't think I've seen that yes, tie on here before. Yes. It looks great. Right, enough about sure me. I hate the attention. Just talk about the sponsors. Okay, fine. Our, <laughs> I'd love to thank our wonderful funders. So we've got Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the NJ Sharing Network. We have Seton Hall University and the Seton Hall University Bacino Leadership Institute, where uh, you will be doing a mass, leading a master class, which will be super exciting this spring. So we're really excited to be talking about that as well. Good stuff. Hey, listen, um, you'll see our website, stand-deliver.com throughout this program. We're not trying to sell you anything. Not that there's anything wrong with that, to quote a Seinfeld episode, but I gotta tell you something, everything is free on that website, articles, videos you can see, past editions of Lessons in Leadership, all important content. And a guy that I talk to leadership about with more than he would like is on camera right now, all the way from Sarasota, Florida. We are uh, the 18th of February, we're taping. There's a snowstorm going on here. Roger DeRose is the president and CEO of Kessler Foundation. Roger, we'll talk leadership in a second. How's the weather? You know, Steve, it's not snowing down here. You know, it's, uh, I, I know it's snowing up there. I feel for you guys. I, I left there Friday night and you know the amount of snow that we've had in the last couple of weeks there and it's piling on again today, I guess. I return uh, this weekend back to Montclair. So um, looking forward what's to coming back. Just, you, just, you want to know what's, what's Steve? It's uh, I 80, 80 degrees here today, oh. Steve. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, what the, the question I get from the employees most often is, when are we going to have a winter office in Sarasota, Florida? So we're working on that, Steve. You're working on it. Okay. That, that's, <laughs> listen, by the way, Roger, the last in-person luncheon I had, <laughs> well, again, we're taping this in, in uh, late February and things are going to get better. You know, I'm Catholic right. and doing, I shouldn't do the sign of the cross on a show like this, right. but I got to tell you something, we're all praying that things get better, that pe more and more people get vaccinated, that it, things get better. We don't know. But the last luncheon I had was with Roger. We were 14 feet apart. No. <laughs> we had a great conversation. Roger, let's do this. Our personal conversations are one thing about leadership, but I've been wanting to ask you this on the air for a while. We do a leadership academy at Kessler Foundation. You're committed to leadership development. Some people think that it takes a break. We can't do leadership development during a pandemic. We don't have the money. We don't have the space. We can't do it. It's not a priority. I know you don't see it that way. No, I don't, uh, Steve. And Mary, it's good to be with you as well. Uh, Steve, you know, I think our view, my view certainly, is that if you're a, a learning organization, that you have to continue investing in learning in your people. And uh, while we have some of the brightest people that you could ever want in the 160 employees that we have at Kessler Foundation, PhDs and masters and of course, the scientists being PhDs, some of the most learned people in the world, um, and they're great at what they do in their research areas of brain and spinal cord injury and stroke and multiple sclerosis and other mobility and cognitive challenges. The one area that we really can enhance their uh, efficiency, their, uh, their, their ability to manage people is through leadership programs. And I think that's the area that, you know, we have focused on with you over the last four years with now two groups that have gone through the leadership series with you, Steve, and it's really made a difference. And I, I have some stories that I'd love to tell you about that in terms of how that has impacted individuals right in our organization, Steve. Well, let's follow up on that. 
Mary, before you, Mary, before you jump in here, you and I have talked about this a lot. Just to be clear, the Kessler Foundation, um, the Reader's Digest, I'll age myself again, description of Kessler Foundation. Go ahead, Roger, please, because I want to get into, these are the smartest people. They're brilliant. But go ahead, Roger. Well, Steve, we, we focus on really changing the lives of people with the types of disabilities that I talked about just a moment ago. And we're really all about enabling change for those individuals so that they can rejoin their family, rejoin their community, rejoin the workforce. And that's what we do on the research side. And that's also what we do in terms of our grant making programs in terms of helping to create employment opportunities for people with disabilities. So here's the thing. I've coached these people in this leadership academy heavy on communication skills, uh, being able to communicate in the media in remote communication, making more concise, compelling presentations, going before government agencies where you're seeking grants. Here's the thing. These are incredibly bright people, scientists, researchers, et cetera. What in your view, Roger DeRose, is the connection between research, science, and being a great leader slash communicator. Can I just be in my laboratory, do my work, do my research? Can I just do that? Why do I have to be a leader? It's a great question, Steve. And you know, oftentimes uh, someone would think of a researcher or a scientist where they're so technical, they're so analytical that if you were serving food that you would typically just slide it under the door and just leave them be. But that, that's not the case at, at Kessler Foundation. I think, you know, from our point of view, the, these are scientists that are uh, top in the world. They are competing at the world, on the world stage for NIH grants. They're competing for the Department of Defense grants for the great grants program that we have in New Jersey through the New Jersey Brain Injury Commission and the Spinal Cord Injury Commission grants. But you know, it, it doesn't stop there, Steve. They, they have people that report to them. They have uh, international and domestic conferences that they, they attend uh, uh, to share their research findings. And they have people that they have to manage. And those management issues don't disappear just because you're a great scientist. And uh, one of the stories I, I think you would find so interesting, Steve, is that we had a, a, a challenge that came up uh, not too long ago. And it had to do with uh, personnel related matter. And one of my questions, because I know who's gone through the uh, Steve Adubato leadership program and I follow them. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, questions that I asked them as we were talking about the challenge, the personnel challenge, was, you know, you've been through the Steve Adubato leadership program. Now tell me, what do you think the decision you would make based on the inputs and the kind of the case studies that you've talked about in terms of those leadership programs? Because everybody, I know you go around the room and you talk to them about individual situations that they go through. I call, gave, it forced, I call it forced engagement, but go ahead. Forced Roger. engagement, that's right, Steve. <laughs> it's exactly right. And Steve, you know, they, they came up with the answer. Uh, and I said, well, I think that's the, that's the answer. And that's the solution that you really have to deal with with regards hmm. to this personality, this personal personnel issue. So that's just one example. And I can count uh, the communication um, enhancements that our scientists have had now. I recall... One time, Steve, you and I were talking early on, this had to be seven, eight years ago, and you said one of the most difficult challenges that you have in an interview is interviewing a scientist, a researcher, because they talk up here. I mean, they're brilliant, but communicating at a level that everyone understands in lay friendly language is something that you have really helped to enhance in our program with some of the best well, scientists in the country. Mary, well, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Hopefully, that means our contract is, is renewed. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> I think those stories definitely bode well for us continuing our partnership there and coaching with those folks. And but, more, and but Mary, more important than ever before in the age of COVID, beyond people talking about variants and this mutation, what? 
Yeah, Wait, exactly. Speak, yeah, I'm sorry. Pick it up, Mary. Yeah, I was just going to say, Roger, you were reading my mind as you were talking about they have PhDs and they're the smartest and the brightest. And but it is so hard to get them to talk in layman's terms. If they're talking, say, to get a grant for the Kessler Foundation, if they're talking to a patient and their family members. So what advice do you give them? Because obviously they want to show their expertise and they are using the right words. But why is it so important for them when communicating to use words and language that people can understand? Well, I, I, I think, Mary, that it really comes down to, you know, the, the, the language that is common to all of us. And that is that, you know, we're, we're not talking at a research level every day. Most of the time we're talking at a high school level that people really understand. And I think to inject the human element into what a manager is is so important as well. And I think they've really received that end of the benefit from the programs that Steve has uh, led for us over the last four years also, Mary. Yeah, yeah but Roger, forget about me and what we're doing. The thing about Kessler Foundation that's always struck me is that we've done so many forums. We've had, beyond what we say, when Kessler Foundation has hosted events, talking about spinal cord injuries and people um, getting better and in technology and research. And someone gets up with a robotic, help, help me on the language on this, Roger, with the skeleton, you know, the- Exoskeleton, yes. And he or she walks right. and then shares where they were and where they are and how their life is different. Talk about communication. Forget about what we say. Sure. What does that say, Roger DeRose? Well, you know, that, that's what it's all about, right, Steve, in terms of how that is communicated to donors, to individual family members, in terms of how we communicate that in other uh, communication programs, such as this one here, where we're actually, you can actually demonstrate how you're changing a person's life, Steve. And that's that what I think our individuals have really been able to do now they take it from a research component and really bring it down to the human element. And they become very, very good at that. All of our scientists have that have gone through this type of program. Mary, I want to talk to Roger a little bit about fundraising and relationship building, but jump in again, Mary. Yeah, no, definitely. And I and Steve, I-, I, I mean, What do they say, 80 degrees, Mary? I just want to check on that. 80 I know, degrees, I know. So. It's, it's so hard to even sit here and think warm with I it know. being so, so when you come back, definitely- Bring some of that warm weather with you for sure. And and I was going to transition and pivot into the fundraising, especially over the last year when this airs right now, we're taping in February of 2021. But over the last year and with the one year anniversary coming up of the pandemic happening, how hard has it been to get people to continue to buy into what you're doing and to support what you're doing? Because truly you're saving lives and improving lives. And, you know, what is that connection there between running a nonprofit keeping, you know, the bottom line where it is and in, in, in the, you know, in the black. And so what are some of the keys and tips that you have for other nonprofits out there that may be listening? Well, you know, Mary, um, one, one of the, as the pandemic reached its peak during those first three months, you know, we were working remotely from March 15th through June 15th, but then we started coming back uh, on June 15th at 50% and then 75% in the middle of July and then 100% after Labor Day. And that was really important. But you know, the important part about that was making sure that the employees felt that we created a safe environment for them to come back. So we plowed a lot of money into protective equipment uh, from everything that you can imagine, from filtering systems and ultraviolet lights and gowns and glasses, et cetera. So we made the environment safe so the employees could come back. During that three months that we were working remotely, the employees were engaged in really looking at their data, writing new grants. They were, they were uh, turning what they could into tele-research programs. And that was vital because we were staying in touch. With yeah, it sounds patient. like it's yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but it sounds like you were taking a challenge and turning it into a true opportunity yeah. of how to get creative, how to pivot, and how to remain in touch with your key stakeholders. Exactly. And I think it was so important for us to return to the workplace because we're dealing with patients in real time. And you know, the functional gains that they were able to achieve prior to the pandemic many of those disappear if you don't have them back in, the, in, the, in the, the research labs. And so that was a vital part about our success in terms of 
making it through 2020 where so many other organizations were facing challenges, whether that was continuing relationships with their donors because their donors fell off, or it was because they were starting to run out of other funding. Uh, we were able to have one of our best years ever in 2020 because of the way we worked with our employees, brought them back, and always stayed in touch with our patient research subjects as well. Roger, before I let you go, um, one more question, a, a topic you and I talk about all the time. I'm obsessed with the idea of the connection between leadership and physical fitness. And people are like, what? What are you talking about? Meaning taking care of yourself, exercise, nutrition, just taking care of yourself and leadership. Roger works out every day. I, I'm not gonna talk about, I do what I need to do to be ready to do this. And I'm a big believer that there's a connection and that your level of energy is, go ahead, I'm off my soapbox. Go ahead, Roger. Well, no, I, I believe in it, uh, Steve. You know, this is something that I've been doing from my years playing sports and then making the transition into the business world and even into uh, leading a nonprofit now. And I believe that there's cognitive benefits that come from that rush of blood flow that goes through the body in addition to keeping the body moving. You know, a body in motion, you've heard it many times, stays That's right stays active, right? And, uh, and that's so important. So it's one of the, I think, the, the breaks that an individual has where they can really separate themselves from the pressures of everyday working and the, the demands that we have on our life as leaders to that moment in time when you can take that break and still ref feel refreshed and revitalized and come back uh, 100% in terms of the demands of the workforce. By the way, Mary, as we're doing this, is still waiting for her Peloton bike to come. Oh, because um, I've been pushing I am. it forever. And <laughs> Mary, she's already in great shape. Then she's going to get on that bike. Listen, we're not plugging Peloton. Our great friend John Foley, the CEO, check out that interview. Whatever you do, do something. Get moving, as Roger said. Hey, Mary, how, how great is Roger DeRose, whether he's in Montclair, New Jersey, or Sarasota, Florida? Can you stop, please? Stop rubbing it in. All the viewers right now are just shaking their head, as I'm sure there's another snowstorm going on even when this airs. So thank you, Roger. Bring some of that warm weather back up this way. Sure Mary, what you're missing is that I have, I'm working on an invitation that I'm from Roger to get to Sarasota. That's why <laughs> I keep plugging it. <laughs> hey, Roger, thanks, our, my friend. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Great to be with you. Thank you. That's Roger, I'm Steve, that's Mary. This is Lessons in Leadership. We'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Valley Bank, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do. Uh, lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Mary, um, real quick, bef before we talk about Roger DeRose and what he was saying, let's, let's thank our promotional partners. Definitely. It's definitely a great time to do so. So we've got CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, as well as NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine. And I'd also love to do a shout out to Michael Reuter and 3MinuteLeadership.com. If you go to 3MinuteLeadership.com, you can register to receive a very powerful, inspirational, brief three-minute leadership uh, email every Sunday morning. So I never start my Sunday without it. Same here. Um, real quick, on Roger, it, again, we have a Leadership Academy at 
at Kessler Foundation. And um, these are incredibly bright people. Mary, how often have you and I been in conversations or done seminars or been in meetings where someone who's got an incredibly advanced academic background, clinical background, research background, it is challenging for folks to communicate what they know to others who don't know what they know. It is so hard. They're often in their lane. They're often using acronyms, uh, complicated words. Jargon. Which is jargon. If they're in their own medical community um, or in their trade, if we're talking you know, to whether they're engineers, uh, it's fine if you know your audience. But if your audience is lay people, if you're talking to an, in an interview to just the common community who's going to be following along, you need to, and I hate to use the expression, but you got to dumb it down a little bit. You need to make it in language that people will understand. I don't think it's done, Mary, I, I, listen, I don't wanna get into a game of semantics with you. It's, it, I don't call it dumbing it down. Here's what I say. And you and I have talked about this before. When we're coaching people, I say, look, be more audience or other centered. What, what do you mean? Well, listen, you're speaking for yourself. You're speaking to yourself in the way you would speak to yourself. Try to imagine what it might be like to be on the other end of this, whether it's a doctor talking to a patient, a lawyer talking to a client, a scientist talking to, and especially in the age of COVID and the vaccine and the, and the mutation and the variant. I didn't go to medical school. The rest of us didn't either. Mm -hmm. Communicate to your audience in a way that you believe they would understand using analogies, using examples. And again, Mary, when Mary says dumbing it down, she's in no way it's not a pejorative statement about your audience. It's not at all. No, I, I'm talking are. about me. I, I, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about the fact that I did not go to medical school. So don't assume that I know that information. So make it simple. Keep it simple and tell a story. As you had said, use anecdotes. Stories resonate with people more than facts and statistics and big fancy words. Well said. Uh, by the way, we're about to introduce uh, Maria Viscarando, who is the president and CEO of an organization called Council of New Jersey Grant Makers. I've known Maria for many, many years. She joined us on our public television um, with our partners on public television. But I also thought, hey, wait a minute. She's a great leader. We want to hear, hear her views on leadership and how she's come to be who and what she is as a leader. So Mary and I will be back on the back end. This is Maria Viscarando. Lessons in Leadership is honored to be joined by our good friend Maria Viscarando, President and CEO, Council of New Jersey Grantmakers. Maria, you and I for years have talked about a whole range of issues, but, but I've never really gotten you to talk about what you perceive to be the most significant leadership lesson that you have learned over these few years in the business. What would you say the number one lesson you learned is? My number one lesson in leadership is probably that being a servant to people is what really helps you become a more effective and influential leader. In what do you mean servant? Um, I believe in the servant in the, the the servant leadership model, which is that you're there to serve people. And so when you do that, what you tend to do is spend more time looking at what's the best in people and then trying to coordinate that into uh, hmm. translate that into into work. I find that that's what creates legacies and it's much bigger than you are. Uh, yeah, quick follow up on this. You and I are both born and raised in Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. And I had this crazy idea, or maybe it's not crazy, I don't know, that a lot of my leadership style, a lot of my approach to dealing with being a leader is based on growing up in Newark on the situations that I faced and, and had to deal with. Right. We were both very young children uh, mm -hmm. during the 1967 uprising, rebellion, riots in, in Newark. It was a tough, tough time. And, and you can you know, I love when people try to over exaggerate how bad it was. It was bad. There's no other way to say that. I'm convinced there's a question here. Trust me, I'm convinced that growing up how we did where we did and we didn't grow up in exactly the same situation, obviously. But it makes you who you are in part as a leader, you say. Absolutely. Absolutely. That you take the lessons from those experiences and you help and you use them to grow and expand who you are as a person. Did I it make you tougher as a leader. Absolutely. <laughs> it helped me to deal. It helped me to deal with your dad. Imagine. <laughs> I knew that was coming. 
I knew that Big Steve. You know, Big Steve, that's how I dealt with Big Steve. Okay, hold on. Seriously, let's deal with this. Big Steve, my dad, who passed away in the fall of 2020. This will be seen in 2021. Let's just say this. He was big on finger pointing. He was big on telling you what you needed to do. Listen to me, he would say. And he was tough on me. And he tried to be tough with Maria Viscarano, but it didn't always work so well. Go ahead. True that. But if anything, what I learned from that is if you can deal with people who present questions, you better be ready to have answers. And I learned through the year to be able to have the kind of answers that help me get over whatever travesty I may be going through, any trauma I was going through. It helped me. It was kind of healing to be able to look at things and be able to look at them objectively and then come back and use what I learned from that to move to move the needle on whatever the issue was, whether it's some poverty situation, whether it is racism or whatever. And that's what makes the difference. It makes you more resilient. In my mind, resilient. You, you have no choice. You can't crawl under the covers as a leader the way you and I, I think, um, grew up and, and experienced. And at least with my dad, I knew you couldn't crawl under the covers and say, listen, I don't want to play today. No, exactly. He'll pull the I don't cover want to be in the game. Off. He'll pull the cover <laughs> off and get you. <laughs> and he wouldn't do it gently. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So uh, um, but those are great. But those are experiences. And that's how I, I molded who I am. And people yeah. may want to call me a leader because I have ti- I've had titles through the years. But I think leadership comes from what did you produce during the time you're in that title? How did you make a difference? How did you have other people? That's right. How did you mentor other people so that once you left, there wasn't a void? And one of the things I'm very proud of is most of the places that have been up to this point left no voids. There's lots of great leaders uh, that's right. who followed me from there. And that's, that's leadership. Yeah. Hey, listen to Maria. It'll remind you, titles do not make the leader. Well yeah. said. Maria, thank you so much, my friend. All the best. That was Maria Viscarando. Um, Mary, the servant leadership stuff, talk about it. So powerful. She talks about servant leadership, leaving legacies. And I always talk about that, right? It doesn't matter how much you, how hard you work in life and all the money that you bring in. What really matters is the impact you leave on the world. And if you can look back and say, you want to know what I really made a difference in one life or a hundred lives, then you've really uh, led a good life. And I think that was the biggest lesson I took away from her interview. You ever notice how someone will say, I hear people say, so-and-so is a great leader. Well, how do you know? Well, look how much how much money they made. I don't necessarily correlate. Listen, more money. That's great. Good for you. I'm a big, I'm big on capitalism. Okay. I admit it. (laughs) I like money. (laughs) Money money is nice, but it does not solve all, all problems. That's for sure. But it also doesn't make you a great leader. It makes you someone who can make a lot of money. That's not the same thing. What's the difference, Mary? It's a huge difference. If you're a great leader, you're bringing in a bunch of money and you are building your team, you're empathizing with others, you are building others up. Uh, Many of the guests that we've had on the show talk about surrounding yourself with people um, smarter than you. If you're doing all of those things and if you're giving back to others, then you're a great leader. The money is just the icing on the cake. Interesting expression on our public television series. We've been doing it for, I don't know, more than 10, 12 years called uh, making a difference. Believe it or not, the term making a difference comes from the Russ Berry making a difference awards. Uh, the late, great Russ Berry, Russ toys, those stuffed toys, right? Started recognizing people who make a difference. And for 25 years, 25, we actually do a series called 25 for 25. Check it out on our steveautobato.org website. 25 people over the years that the Russ Berry Foundation has been recognizing for making a difference. They're leaders. That's what leadership is. That's Mary Gambin. By the way, she makes a difference every day. So does everybody behind the scenes. To Elvin, to Frank, to Scarlin, to Sylvester, to everyone. It takes more than a village, particularly to prop this guy up. Hey, thanks, Mary. Say goodbye, Mary. (laughs) Goodbye, Steve. And goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. Be well. That's it. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gambin, is brought to you by Valley Bank, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. 
This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.